first started uh, my profession bucolically many years ago, uh, I was looking at native insects that were really never a real problem. Uh, the primary goal of my research was to minimize the impact of losses associated with these, and never did I think I would ever consider looking at insects that could eliminate whole species or whole genera of trees. Um, the impact of the invasive species, I think, is something that is just way beyond what I ever considered as possible. But here it is, it's in our lap. We could lose the hemlocks. We could lose all the, all the ash trees, at least in New York State. So, I mean, the, the implications, I think, of these invasive species now um, are such that I think it's really important to, I think, pay attention to what we can do. You know, it's like if we focus on what we can do, it won't be as depressing as it really is. No, that's, that, that's not right. Anyway, so I'm, I'm going to, what basically I'm going to go through, you know, a couple of these bugs. And I think it's, um, I'm not going to do the usual thing. I, I think it's really important for you to get like a feeling for uh, what I think is going to happen. You know, it's just like the, the, the stuff that's behind, between the lines in uh, the usual reading on these. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, and it's a, it's a really ugly bug. It's you know, a little tiny aphid-like thing. Uh, it feeds on the twigs of, of the hemlock tree. And here you can see the little white dots on, on there right now. Um, the interesting thing is that this insect came from five native populations. Um, there's two in China, two in Japan, and one in the Pacific Northwest. Um, the population that we have now in uh, eastern North America is from Japan. Interestingly enough, it doesn't, it, this genotype, we've, they've done extensive genetic work with the populations we have invading the east, and none of them has matched from the west coast here. And so what we think happened is that it came over from Japan in, uh, um, in um, nursery stock. So in North America, it feeds on eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock on the east coast, <laughs> and it kills them. And then a western hemlock, um, on the West Coast. And so I'm from Washington State, actually, and one time it dawned on me when I was visiting my parents that it might be best to actually go to the Arboretum there and see if they have any Eastern hemlocks. And sure enough, they, I called them up, they were very nice, they said, oh yeah, here's the Eastern hemlocks, and they were planted in 1945, and they were right next to the Western hemlocks. And both of them looked just fine. Both of them were green and healthy, and both of them had hemlock woolly adelgids. Not a lot but they had hemlock woolly adelgids. So my question ever since then has been, you know, it's like, what the heck is going on? And the other side of me says, well, it works somewhere. Eastern hemlock is resistant somewhere, so there's hope. And I think it's important to pay attention to that. There's hope, at least in Washington State. We can keep the species alive, maybe. But no, really, I'm being facetious. I think it's really important to keep that in mind, that there is, there is hope. This is just to scare you, sort of like, this is the most complex life cycle of any insect I've ever imagined. There's basically seven distinct adult forms of this insect. Um, it has two host trees, and that's the most important thing to remember. Spruce, we call the primary host. Hemlock, we call the secondary host. Spruce is the primary host because that's where there's sex, okay? There's only sex on spruce trees. On hemlock trees, there's no sex. They're all females, and that's the problem. In North America, even though we have a native population on the West Coast, none of the spruce trees are suitable for sex. Only, only hemlocks on the West Coast. And the same thing, <coughs> excuse me, I got a bug in my throat. Um, the, excuse me, the uh, uh, hemlocks on the East Coast, there's no spruce on the East Coast that are suitable for sex. And it's interesting though, even though the one in Japan that is found to have sex, which is Picea polita, is actually planted right next to my office in the Arboretum at Cornell. And I've been watch looking for that thing to see if I could find a sexual stage. And I've yet to find anything yet. Uh, and indeed, a friend of mine who's done a lot of research in Japan says that it is not very common that he sees uh, uh, sex on the primary host, the spruce. Um, 
And uh, so I think, you know, my gut feeling is this insect is really driven for this asexual stage. And indeed, a lot of adelgids, they just are very, very prominent in the asexual part of their life cycle. This is a more simplified life cycle. Basically, two generations a year, okay? So right now, we're right about here. We're a few weeks late because this is a very cold winter. Okay, so the adults are just about to begin laying their eggs. The eggs hatch, and when the eggs hatch, they turn into a crawler, which is a teeny tiny little thing. This is about a millimeter, the adult, about a millimeter. Here's some eggs right behind it. So that little crawler is about a, you know, less than a tenth of a millimeter, but it's really fast. It's the only stage that it gets around. And you get into a stand of trees, the wind is gonna blow it and carry it through the stand. But for long distance dispersal, we think that birds are perhaps one of the most important components. What happened, imagine the bird landing on a branch. That little thing actually, even though it's a little tiny dot, it's actually very fast. And where there's so many of them on a branch, it could easily crawl onto the foot of a bird. The bird will then go where? Probably to another hemlock tree uh, and land, and it'll get off of that tree. So that is the only stage that it's mobile. It settles down, and once that crawler settles down and puts its sucking mouth parts, into the twig tissue, not the needle, into the twig, um, it will not move for the rest of its life. And indeed, you can yank it out of that twig and it'll die. It won't be able to reinsert its mouth parts, okay? So then it completes, the progridians generation is completed perhaps in late May, early June, lays their eggs, the crawler comes out, the crawler settles, and the crawler, after it settles, it turns into this little tiny black dot. And it spends most of the summer, July, throughout probably till the end of October, looking just like this. And so there's actually a really great advantage to that life cycle um, in that when are the most of the predators out feeding? Summertime, right? And if you're this little tiny dot that's really, really hard to see, I mean, really, it's hard to see this thing without a magnifying glass on the twig. Um, what's gonna eat you? I mean, you, just, you're not juicy, you're not so, oh, thank you. Yes, I was. Thank you. I talked too much just recently. Are they sucking when they're doing that? Uh, this is an estivating stage or a resting stage. So they're not mm -hmm. sucking at all at that point in time. Okay? It's only when they start growing in the end of October and they start fattening up. This is what they look like probably you know, in March. Uh, um, you know, what they're looking like right now. They're way behind schedule because of the cold winter that we had. And so if you see a tree like that right about now, that's what they look right, right about now. Okay, so two generations a year, okay, and the eggs, the crawlers are out only here in March and then in June. This is what the crawler looks like under magnification. It's really fast when you look at it under a microscope, very fast. Um, and this is, here you see there's a crawler on the white woolly mass of the, uh, of the adult. And this is what the crawler looks like once it settles. You can see it's right at the base of the needle. You'll get one, two, or here's a whole clump of them uh, at the base of the needle. That's pretty intense density right there. So this is what the adult looks like uh, in electron microscopy. These little glands up here, they produce the white woolly stuff. Um, and the mouth parts here, they see they're all wrapped up. They're actually, if you were to compare it all, they would, at this size level, the mouth parts actually extend probably way down here onto the floor. Um, they're really, really long in relationship to the body. And indeed, when you, when you, whip, when you rip them out of the, out of the twig, uh, they're actually, they'll whip them around. They're actually really, uh, uh, how do you say, flexible. They'll just keep whipping, and that's sort of interesting to me since they normally just stay in one place when they're feeding. Um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there, it's just entomological fun. Um, so here's a picture of the adult with the, uh, with the woolly stuff taken off with eggs in the background, and here's the eggs mixed up in the wool of the adult. So what is the impact on the trees? Um, how does it kill a tree? That's, that's uh, been a, a good question. And basically what happens is that it inserts its stylets or mouth parts at the base of the needle and feed on the xylem ray parenchyma cells. And when it does that, you can see the density all along this twig right here. Well, it's sort of like a, uh, you know, imagine a voodoo doll with a bunch of needles in it. Um, what happens is that when the, when the insect puts its mouth parts into that twig, at each point of insertion, the, a tree, the tree actually has a generic 
wound response reaction where it walls off that wound. And so if you've got all those little needle points going in there, it walls them off. And eventually, it inhibits greatly the capacity of the tree to move water and minerals out to the growing buds. And that's what kills the tree. It isn't the fact that it's sucking stuff out of it. It's the fact that the tree has wounded itself by walling off those wounds. Um, so that's what, that's what kills the foliage and, and the buds primarily. Um, and it, there's a big debate in my mind, as well as with my colleagues, on how long it takes to kill trees. Um, in the south, uh, where it's warm, four years is pretty much thumb's rule, from when it first becomes infested to when it dies. Um, up here, in the Finger Lakes, I see about six years. And it's been here a long time. And there are many places, I think, where it's been infested, trees have been infested for maybe up to 20 years. Um, what it is that does that, I don't really know. I was skiing with a colleague of mine um, in uh, 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 Amherst, Massachusetts, not too long ago, just this last winter. And we were skiing through a, a, a group of trees. And he asked me, I mean, they looked really bad. And he asked me, he said, well, how long do you think these have been infested? And of course, I shrugged my shoulders, knowing there was a looper coming my way. And he said, yeah, well, it's been about 20 years. And so you know, I'm thinking, yeah, OK. Maybe in colder areas it takes longer. Maybe in better climate types, maybe better soil conditions, it takes longer to kill a tree because they're stronger. Um, but I also see them dying. And so I know that they, you know, it's like even though they maybe they're infested for a long time, they do eventually succumb. And indeed, there's a, I remember I've been watching on the road going up to Tannersville, I've been watching a group of trees that now is totally dead. And, um, and in other places. And, you know, and in the Finger Lakes, that's not 20 years. I mean, we're looking six years in the Finger Lakes area. Now, is that a drier soil type? Is it warmer there? It could be. Um, I don't know. But anyway, uh, I, I am an arch conservative when it comes to things like this. And I'm not going to wait around and, and you know, speculate on how long they're going to stay alive. And maybe this will be their, you know, they'll be their savior. I don't think so. I think that they will eventually succumb. And so that's the way I'm planning on my management activities. Um, so what is the problem? All females, asexual reproduction. Um, there is no founder effect. Basically, all it takes is one individual to start a whole population. That's a very critical aspect of the biology. Then you also consider the very high reproductive potential. Two generations a year, maximum up to 200 eggs per female. That's rarely occurred in nature, but still that would be 40,000 individuals from one. I think it's much more reasonable to consider maybe 100 eggs, maybe a little bit less from the, from the first from the cystins, 50 eggs from the uh, progridians. I mean, that would make 5,000 progeny per year from one successful establishment. Uh, so that reproductive potential is huge. The other thing is there are no native natural enemies uh, in the eastern US, um, although we are working on biocontrol, and I'll get into that. Um, but also, there's no documented resistance by eastern hemlock or Carolina hemlock. Although we have putatively found some kind of resistance, it takes a long time to evaluate resistance in hemlock tree, in trees in general, because they can be resistant when they're young or resistant at different life stages, but they're a long-lived tree. And so when you're evaluating little seedlings, you're not evaluating big trees. And generally, I want to see a tree grow to be big. And so it takes a long time to really know that you're looking at it. So how do you find? Uh, that it actually survives uh, the, uh, the insect infesting it. It's resistant. There's something about the gene genes in that tree that allow it to survive an attack by the adelgid. That would be resistance in this case. Okay, so for detection, I mean, you can look at it from a long distance, and these, these branches here are just chock a block full of adelgids, and they have a silvery gray appearance to them. Um, very easy to see from a long distance. This is on Skinny Atlas Lake. Um, but when I actually go into a, 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 a stand of trees, there are a number of things that I look at. Number one is you look at the branches that are near the ground. Um, and really, if, if, there's HW, if, if there are delgids in the top of the tree, you'll see them in the bottom of the tree because the crawlers will rain down. Okay? Um, 
a lot of people say you can use binoculars. I don't like binoculars because they get a lot of false positives looking at the reflection on the top of the leaves. Um, and, uh, uh, but um, actually one of my favorites is right now, um, after the winter, you have like the porcupines have been knocking down branches and windstorms knock down branches. And so there's tons of nice fresh branches on the ground after the snow. And you can pick those up and look at them. It's really easy to do. Um, and also, the most important thing is when you're looking in a stand, be sure to look at branches that are near water. Because consider what a bird will do when it comes into an area. It'll maybe land on branches, go down to water, come back up, and then take off. When it does that, it, it puts the crawlers on the branches. And there are two times, I think, that I really have found the first attacks in a stand. And they have been on trees, right next to the water, and the branches right next to the water have had the adelgid on them, not the branches that are away from the water. It's, it's really quite, quite stunning to find that first tree. And I'll, I'll describe the situation later on. Um, also, one of the, my favorites is to notice the white woolly stuff that gets knocked out of the tree by wind or by rain. And you'll see it, especially on the, the wet bark of a tree, it shows up like a little glowing light. Um, but then also, I, I have a, a Canadian colleague and I are developing this technique of, that's you know, sort of fun, you know, scientists got to have fun, where we actually uh, have a slingshot and we have this Velcro on a ball and we put the slingshot up into the tree and it collects the wool like that. Um, it's, it's interesting because I go into the stand and every time we do that and uh, we're shooting the balls in the tree, I'll turn around and I'll look at the bark of the tree and I'll see that. But you know, it's like not everybody can do that. It takes a lot of time and, and to get used to that thing. But this, somebody can go into a stand. You know, some you train people minimally. They go into a stand, they'll find it, and that's what this is all about. The Canadians are very worried about their trees right now. They're just finally got it in the Niagara a Gorge area, and um, so they're really desperately ser searching for early detection. As am I in the Adirondacks. Um, so this is what it looks like in the summertime. I like this picture because you can actually see the cell structure on the twig. And you can see how small those dang things are. Um, this is what it looks like in an early infestation. Now, you can differentiate early infestation from other infestations because there are so dang many of these things. And they're feeding on twigs that are one, two, three years old. Um, whereas that doesn't happen. Usually, after this first year, the fact that they have pierced the tissue and degraded its quality, there's so much of the tissue that, that they can't really come back to it because it's already been degraded. And what happens is they will prefer just the newly expanded branches. Now, if you've killed all the buds, there aren't going to be very many of those uh, newly expanded branches or twigs out there. Like in this picture here, see the buds have been killed. You've got a couple on these, on these other old twigs, but the new twigs here you can see there's more coming out there. New twig here, there's more coming out there. So this is what happens in the middle of an infestation after the first year or two, where the tissue quality is really decreased. And then you only find them really on the newly elongated twigs. In the later part of an infestation, which a lot of the trees around here look like this. Um, by the way, it's really cool coming to a place to give a talk and you got both your bugs right next door. I went out there and I found the hemlock woolly adelgid right next to on the hemlocks. And you just look right out the window there and you can see ash trees that are, that are woodpecked uh, with emerald ash borer in them. What? This? That's the spittle bug. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was trying to move along because last time I did this, I was way behind. Um, yeah, that's spittle bug. Um, so this is actually, this is not a spittle bug. This is actually not a, it's a, supposed to be a North Star. Uh, it, some computers, it turns out weird. But anyway, this, this shows you, this is the whole distribution of hemlock in North America, Eastern hemlock in North America. And this is almost the current, this is 2008. Right now it's probably up this area all the way across into here. Uh, it's expanded all the way down there. So, you know, basically this, I just, I, I think it's important for people to understand that, yes, it's covered about half of the distribution of the species in North America. And um, it's time to be concerned. And a lot of times I think uh, people sort of like, 
uh, entomologists, professionals, have considered this to be a bug that's limited by temperature, and so they think about the northernmost range of these trees as being pretty much in, uh, uh, not, not vulnerable to it because of the cold temperatures, but I don't think that's the case, and I'll describe, describe that. Uh, suffice it to say, the Canadians right now are really, really worried about this insect. Um, so you look at the hemlock resource in New York State, and um, you know, okay, so it goes all the way up here to Schenectady. We just found it in the, the pine bush. Um, it's, there's a little bit here in the northern Catskills, but definitely all throughout this region of the Catskills. Um, it's all around the Finger Lakes. It's spotty through here, uh, down, down near Binghamton and Elmira. Uh, it's spotty through here in the, finger, the east, western Finger Lakes. It's in Letchworth, it's in Allegheny, and it's in Zoar Valley. So it's, it's heavy all through this area here. It's spot heavy in here, spotty in here. It's not in the Adirondacks. And look at the concentration of, of, of hemlock in the Adirondacks. That really is, in my mind, the big gorilla in the closet right now. And I think that if we don't get going with our efforts to grow the biological controls at this point in time, the Adirondacks will be toast. Because there's so many trees in there, it's going to spread so rapidly that really uh, we're, we're looking at a very big problem. Uh, this is the growth from the late 80s all throughout the state, by town by town. This is nursery stock here, nursery stock here. This is natural, just natural expansion all throughout there. Then I don't know what, how it got started in here, but the Finger Lakes is just really filled in uh, recently. And this is what it looks like now. So all this area in here is, and it's also not, it's our capacity to detect it uh, that has filled in the dots in here. But you see that, you know, it's like we're moving right along here in New York State. Um, and uh, once again, we don't have a lot of time. I think it's also important to realize the ecological impact of this insect. Um, you think about hemlocks and, you know, they're not, I, I, I like them. To me, they're warm and fuzzy. I, I just like hemlocks. It's not their economic value. I think it's the ecological value that is most important. Um, and when you think about hemlocks, uh, they're, they're what, what we consider a, a foundation species, um, where they occupy the base of the food web. Uh, they're, they're critical species in the habitat that they cre help, help create. Now think about it, okay? If you take ash out of a hardwood forest, what do you have? You still have a hardwood forest. It's still, you know, even though ash is important in early successional uh, situations, you still have a hardwood forest. But if you have hemlock, you take hemlock out, you all of a sudden have opened up this whole thing. And, you know, it's, it's the shade, it's the acidity of the soils. It creates the environment that all the species depend on that are associated with it. Um, it's generally, and this is disturbing, it's generally so common that we take them for granted. I really think that's true with hemlocks. Um, and we depend on the ecosystems that they build and maintain for a wide range of tangible and intangible services. Um, so that's the definition. When you think about it, though, the water resources, they moderate stream temperatures for trout, very important for the native brook trout to have those cool temperatures. Uh, they provide a buffer for nutrient inputs to maintain water quality. Um, very important with the, water, uh, uh, with the unfiltered water sources we have. They stabilize soils, um, and uh, also they make soil chemistry more acidic, which is you know, important for the soil microorganisms that you think about that need that acidic uh, uh, environment. Uh, provide shelter for animals and plants, uh, especially in winter, critical habitat for neotropical, migrating neo neotropical birds. Um, it's an acidic substrate for lichens. Interesting, there was a study done uh, re uh, recently in England where they're worried about the, all their ash trees dying and the lichens associated with them. You think, what? But they started studying the surfaces of the trees and the chemistry of the trees, finding that they actually, different trees offer different substrates to the lichens. And the fact that if they, if they lose ash, they'll be losing some rare lichens uh, because the substrate disappears. So I thought I'd throw that in there because nobody thinks about lichens usually, right? Um, most people don't even know what a lichen is. Anyway, uh, and mortality opens the stand to invasive plant species, uh, which impedes the establishment of desired forest tree species, of desired species. So this is 
This is the local AA unfiltered water source in the Finger Lakes, Skinny Atlas Lake for the uh, city of Syracuse. This ravine here is filled with hemlock, and here you can see all the agricultural inputs around there and how important uh, these forested ecosystems are for maintaining, for uh, uh, mitigating the, the impact, the input of uh, nutrients from the farm systems into the lake. Um, so, sort of like changing tax here, how, what, how, what do we do? And um, to think about the natural control of insect populations, there's basically three components. Resistance, abiotic factors, and biological control. And uh, host tree resistance, there's many, many factors involved. Mostly are very poorly understood. Um, and once again, it's a very long and involved process to find it. We got better tools every day. Uh, genetic tools and chemical tools are developing, and hopefully it won't be so difficult. But right now, we're just really in the ba doing baby steps when it comes to resistance. Uh, abiotic factors, temperature and humidity. I'll talk more about temperature. Uh, and biological control, predators, parasitoids, and pathogens. Um, biological control, I've just really started working on heavily. Um, but the important thing is that it's an additive effect of all of those things. And so when you think about, okay, you have an asexual insect uh, that pushes out lots and lots of bugs, lots of progeny, you know, the level of control that's needed, the additive level of control, like, you know, it's 75% this, 25% that, 25% that, um, the additive effect is that you need to have basically, see, asexual, probably, you know, 99.9% mortality before you have a stable population. But that's what's happening in the Pacific Northwest. Somehow it's working. So that's what keeps hope eternal in my mind, is that it works other places, Japan, Pacific Northwest. Hopefully we can get to that point here. So cold weather, I just wanted to be sure that everybody was well aware of the fact that, you know, basically forget cold weather. Uh, we've had just had two of the coldest winters that I can, have, that on record. Here, um, the only coldest winter around here was 1934. Uh, in the Finger Lakes, the coldest was this year. Uh, Finger Lakes, Syracuse, Rochester area. Um, work done and in Amherst, Massachusetts showed that 3% survived minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit and none survived minus 31. Um, we got near, we got over this uh, in the Finger Lakes and probably in some areas around here, but that's 3%. And for an asexual insect that reproduces like that, that's huge. I mean, what the heck? The winter before last, remember, it was very cold also. The populations bounced back just like that. I'm really curious, this was a harder winter. I got more mortality this winter than last winter in my studies. I'm really curious what's going to happen this winter. Um, because the kicker is tolerance of low temperatures is a genetically linked trait. Great. Yeah, so you get a couple of survivors, and what do you get? A population that's going to go crazy. Um, however, you know, I, I have questions in my mind, and, and it's basically, so, okay, is there a cost associated with being cold tolerant? Okay, so if you get uh, a, a population where they, they go through that pinprick of selection of really cold temperatures like we got this last winter, where we got 99% mortality or 98% you know, mortality. Um, okay, so you have that portion of the population is resistant. Okay, so given good temperatures, they're gonna mutate, they're gonna change, and perhaps less cold tolerant progeny are gonna come out of that. Given just a couple of years, of warmer temperatures, is that population going to change to become less cold tolerant because those that aren't cold tolerant are more successful? So this is something that can be, you know, that we need to think about, we need to learn. But I will submit to you that there is a really good example of a very close relative called the balsam oleodelgid that we originally thought was cold tolerant or not, it was cold susceptible. And indeed, when I started my graduate work back in uh, 1980, um, we were thinking about, uh, uh, I, was, I loved this bug, uh, the balsam oleodelgid, because it was killing my favorite trees. And I saw that it was actually 
across the Cascades in the Intermountain area where it was really cold. And I tried to get money for it, and everybody said, ah, forget it, it's never going to get into the cold areas. I said, but wait a minute, it's already in the cold areas. Ah, nah, get out of here, you're just a grad student. And so then when I got out here, I noticed it in the Adirondacks up by Blue Mountain, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Blue Mountain Museum up there. And then I got up in the St. Lawrence, and it was there in the St. Lawrence. So I went to the Canadians, and I said, hey, do you guys know about this? And the guy said, ah, forget it, you know, it'll never be here, that's not Balsamoli Adelgid. Well, a couple of summers ago I was hiking in the White Mountains, and there it was on Mount Washington near Timberline. Not, not very warm up there, is it? And so that's a very, very close relative. It's obviously cold adapted, much, and um, so I, I, am I worried about Hemlock Woolly Adelgid? Yes, very definitely. So these are the cold temperatures. Minus 25, minus 30 degrees is, I mean, it's like very, this is the coldest temperature uh, up through March 31st. Um, so there aren't very many areas that are super cold that they probably, according to the research in Amherst, uh, they, they won't survive. Um, I did a study last year and this year at two state parks, Taganic and then Minekill. Minekill is where we have the coldest temperatures in the state, uh, where we have hemlock woolly adelgid. So I found that at Taganic, where it's warmer, minus eight, I got 91% mortality last year. I don't have this year's data up yet. Um, at Minekill, where the lowest temperature was minus 24, this is actually not really that. This is next to the bark of a tree. This is from a temperature instrument about a quarter mile away in the middle of a field. And so it's a lot colder there. How much colder though? I mean, it's definitely colder than this. Um, and I only got 82% mortality. So the colder site, had more survivors. It's pretty, pretty damning. So this is, you know, just the interlude of, you know, this is what we're looking at. Uh, and you imagine the Adirondacks like that. Um, it's right around here, heck. Uh, and indeed, it really is turning out like that. Um, so the biological control program, basically, HWA was first found to be a big problem in 1951. Started working on bowel control in 1993. There's sort of a lag time there. It's too bad because we're really way behind. Uh, there's no parasitoids or little tiny wasps. They're only predators uh, from the ladybird beetles and then derodontid beetles. And we've been using those from Eastern Asia and the Pacific Northwest. So far, six different species have been released in New York. Uh, two in New York, I'm sorry, six around the United States, two in New York, but only one has really been successful so far in New York State. Um, this is the one that doesn't work, and I'm putting it up here because mm -hmm. you can get this insect from a lab down in Pennsylvania right now. If you go online, they offer them for sale, but there's a good reason we've not worked with it is because they put out millions of these things, and we've only found a few sites where it might have established. It's not really very, uh, uh, um, it's very difficult to find, and we've basically abandoned work on it. So, and besides the fact that if you do buy them down in Pennsylvania, you still don't have a permit to, let, to release it in New York State. And I know people have already done that here, basically wasting their money. Um, this is one in the wings. This is a ladybird beetle from uh, China. It looks to be very, very promising. It's just finished all its uh, evaluation work and it's gone through, it's almost finished, it's uh, permitting through the USDA APHIS PPQ. Um, I'm lo really looking forward to getting this. Hopefully New York will be one of the first places we have to release it. Um, I've been working on this for a long time and I really hope we can get it. Right now there's another one from the Pacific Northwest. This is another ladybird beetle. I, I think it's really important when you look at biocontrol, you consider that you can't just use, rely on one insect. You have to have a number of them to occupy all the different uh, habitats, all the different uh, uh, niches available to them. So you, that's the way you're gonna get 99.9% .9 control, is if you have every, all those little places uh, taken care of. Um, this is a, a fly from the Pacific Northwest. I just got my permit to release it here in New York, and um, I have great hopes for this insect. This is the second most abundant predator in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's, it's, for instance, this is difficult though because we can only release the adults. We can't really mm -hmm. release the larvae 
because the larvae might have parasitoids in them. And so if you can get it to an adult, you know it doesn't have any parasitoids, and then you can release it. So all of these things have their little quirks that make it a little difficult to rear and to, and to, uh, uh, to, to, to release. Um, Laracobius osakensis, this is a new insect from China, or from um, uh, Japan, of course, osakensis. Um, it appears to be more aggressive than the one I've been releasing here, uh, but numbers are very low. It's very expensive to rear them in the lab. Um, I'd like to bring this in, but uh, you know, we'll see how supplies go. Um, this is the one I've been working with. This is from the native, uh, native to the Pacific Northwest, Laracobius nigrinus. Laracobius is a, a genus of beetles. Uh, there are most of the beetles in the family eat on fungus. This one genus from around the world only eats adelgids. All Laracobius are associated with different adelgids. Uh, very interesting, very highly synchronized life cycle with hemlock woolly adelgid, where the adults feed on the developing cysts throughout the winter time, laying their eggs when they do, when the adelgids are laying their eggs, uh, and then they develop a pupate in the soil emerging in fall when the adelgids begin to grow themselves. Um, this has been released in 16 states on the East Coast since 2003. Um, the interesting thing is that it became established at many locations, but everybody was saying, where's the beef? You know, it's like you got a few here, you got a few there, what's going on? It's like it's never really, we're not getting any numbers. And then it was uh, a couple of years ago at a meeting, a friend of mine who had, who had done these releases in North Carolina, he came in with this big grin on his face and he said, I just caught 3,000 of these things. So finally we had an indication that it was working. And then in 2013, I went down with him collecting, and we collected 20 miles away from the original release point. So it was really cool. We finally got an indication that it was working. And so at 2013, I went down. I collected 3,000. I brought them up and released them here in New York. Um, other colleagues collected. We got over 12,000 between all of us. Uh, and so it's working in my mind. That they're, they're so prolific. They're out there. They're spreading. Uh, this is a really hopeful. Uh, this is the first really big hopeful sign that we've had in the biocontrol project for hemlock woolly adelgid. In Delaware Water Gap, populations also appear to be growing. Uh, they've been released, uh, they were released later in the Delaware Water Gap, and we'll begin seeing, hopefully, more population expansion over time. Um, these are the locations I've released in, the, in uh, New York State. I released uh, what Minekill State Park is way over here. But these, most of them are in the Finger Lakes for obvious reasons. They're proximal to Ithaca. Um, the first four areas are right here. I released in 2009. And of these four areas, I found them at three locations, one, two, and three. Um, so that's F5, five years of generation, generations. The interesting thing is I released two biotypes, Puget Sound and Idaho. Puget Sound, we thought, would be more susceptible to cold. Idaho would be more cold tolerant. Um, I've caught both of them out there now. So I know that the Puget Sound are tolerant of the cold temperatures last winter. I don't know what will happen this winter, after this winter. And it's a big question in my mind. Should we be working just with the Idaho biotype? Or could, be we, well, could we be working with both biotypes? It's a lot more expensive to go to Idaho and find beetles than it is to go to Puget Sound. So these are the beetles here feeding on the adelgids. Um, the problem with this thing, as far as production goes, if you go to a lab, uh, $4 is actually not right. I was talking to a colleague, and he said it's probably closer to $8 a beetle. And so I usually release 200 to 500 at a site. That's an expensive project. You know, the Forest Service has been very generous in supplying the beetles that I have released. But we really need to go to wild collection, I think and not rely on the labs. I think the prices increase over time uh, because it takes the labs, they have to go further to find good food to feed the beetles because there's no artificial diet that really works. Um, so I plan to go to Puget Sound and do a lot more collecting and hopefully I'll get my colleagues to ship me more beetles from Idaho as well. Um, the interesting thing, so this is my plan for New York State. It's like my, my plan for world domination. Um, 
we really need, you know, the long-term answer is with, insect, is with uh, these predators. And in order to get them going across the state, I think labs is not the answer. I think the much less expensive and more practical alternative is to engage volunteers in locating hemlock hedges like this. This hemlock hedge right here is in North Carolina. I kept going back to this hedge for that one week I was down there. Every time I went to this hedge, I collected 200 predators every day. Boom, 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 200 predators. It was really cool. Um, this is a, a hedge also in uh, Pennsylvania. We caught predators mm -hmm. there, not nearly as many. So my question is, you know, why does this work? My research is focusing on why hedges work so well. Um, but also, you know, it's like rather than release them in the wild, when we release them in the wild, the bugs aren't dumb. They go places where there's food to eat. And so they're not going to stay right on the branches that are close to the ground that are easy to collect them at. They're going to go to the tops of the trees. That's why it's so difficult to find them established where they've been released in wild forests. So my plan now is whenever I get predators, I'm going to put them on hedges like this. And so my job now, the job of everyone in this room, if you're interested, or any other volunteers, are to locate these hedges and so that we know where they are. And then I need to know when they get intelligence on them, when they become infested, so that I know when we can release, some, uh, uh, release predators on them. And then it'll probably take a couple of years. Once you release the predators, then we can monitor them. We can have volunteers monitoring them to look for the predators. And when we get numbers out, then we can collect from these hedges and then bring them to another place, maybe another hedge. Basically build up a network of these field insectaries so that we have an abundance of predators to release when the Delgids finally get to the Adirondacks. Uh, I, you know, that's, that's my plan. Otherwise, the Adirondacks are toast. Uh, but anyway, this is what happens when you start too late. This is 2003 when they first released. The trees were already in decline. And you see there's still a couple in here, though. One, two, three, four. Um, I don't know why they survived. You know, maybe it was the predator, but that's pretty grim. Um, and in the meantime, I think there are places, especially here in the, Adira in the Catskills, that we do have, I think, a situation where there's no way predators are going to be successful. I think we need to look to preserving the genetic resources that we have for the long term. We need to get out there, I think, and treat trees with systemic insecticides to keep them alive so that we have those seeds for future forests. Seed from the hemlocks do not survive storage in cold weather, cold temperatures, you know, like the deep freeze they have in Colorado. You have to keep the trees alive. And I think it's also very important uh, to do that uh, because when you have trees, okay, so backtrack. I've always loved big trees, and um, I, there's a really good reason now I know. There's a gut reason, you know, it's my gut feeling is, oh, it's a gorgeous tree. Oh, yeah, we've got to save it. But they also, what they do is, uh, from my perspective as a forest health professional, is that they represent a bag of genes that has gone through the test of time in that location. It's seen all those assaults that can be thrown at it, and it's survived, and that's what makes it so valuable that this, these are the genes that you want. You know, if you're selecting plants for your garden, you don't want to select for the weak ones down there. You want to select for the really healthy ones to replant your forest or your garden with. Um, so we can use these systemic insecticides to keep trees alive for the long term until we get the biocontrols going. And there are basically two different chemicals that we've been using, imidacloprid and dinotefuran. Imidacloprid is an amazing tool. Um, it's effective for seven years or more with one treatment. Uh, the problem is, is that imidacloprid takes up to a year to get up into the tree, maybe a little bit more. And so if you have a weakened tree, it's not going to be able to transport the imidacloprid up into the canopy, and it'll die. And this is especially was proven, uh, proven true uh, in the south when they were trying to protect the big, huge trees, uh, the old growth trees in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And so they started using dinotefuran, or safari. Safari is a much more fast movement into the tree. It'll actually, they've shown that within just a couple of weeks, it'll get into the tree and take out the hemlock woolly adelgid. 
And when it does that, it allows, it keeps the tissue alive and allows it to take the more long-term imidacloprid up into the tree. So when you got a big tree that's beginning to show decline, it's a one-two punch. Dinotefuran and imidacloprid, and you saved your tree for seven years, or according to a friend of mine in the Delaware Water Gap who's been working on it, he's done treatments where he says he hasn't seen any resurgence of hemlock oleodelgid for 10 years. So, you know, it's like, it's an amazing tool. It's inexpensive, relatively inexpensive, and that's the future of our forest, or in those genes that we keep alive while we get the biocontrol going. Recently, um, I was able to get through uh, the state, this special application technique called basal bark spray. Uh, basal, basal bark spray basically is where you do a, a mixture, uh, or, or you spray the basal bark of the tree, and it goes through the bark into the tree and it gets transported up. And so um, I recently got, for safari, you have to do a basal bark spray, but I recently got a, a, a 2EE recommendation to use imidacloprid, so you can actually do what we call a tank mix, all in one, then you can spray the bark of the tree with those two chemicals all at once, and you get safari moving in for the rapid takedown, keep the trees alive, and then the imidacloprid is there for the long term, so all at once. And it's really good because it's really, uh, it's inexpensive to use, very rapid. And this is an example of what I see happening perhaps in the Adirondacks when we get the first populations there, or in areas of the east of the western Catskills when we first get the introduction in. This is Zoar Valley in um, western New York. These are 450 foot cliffs, by the way, just in case you haven't been there. It's absolutely gorgeous place. Um, but it has this huge old growth forest here owned by the Nature Conservancy. And I was brought in there by, by the Nature Conservancy guide. And within 20 minutes, I found one infested tree. Um, I went back. We spent the rest of the day, that's the red lines here, looking around and we couldn't find anything. Went back in two weeks with more volunteers and we searched a much larger area. And still, that was the only infested tree. And so for me, it was, it was like, I can't believe it. I must be walking on water. But I'm not going to ignore this opportunity. I'm not going to assume there's more. So we went in there, and I, uh, you know, it's like all he needed was was you know some documentation. I wrote a big long letter about what I found and the fact that this is an opportunity that we can't miss. It's like by taking down this population with chemical treatment all around all around these trees, that you know we could perhaps forestall infestation for years and allow the biocontrol to build up. This is the way I see us operating also in the Adirondacks. Well. So this is where it was. There's that infestation right on this branch, right next to the creek. Again, the birds coming in. Um, so the timeline, what the heck, no. I'm not gonna go through this, but basically we marked 395 trees uh, all around this tree here, and they treated them so fast, they said, well, they called me up on their cell phone, Mark, what can we do? And I said, well, go across the creek, because I had not looked at this area here, because the water was too big before. And they went, and they found another two trees right here, and they treated all around those, so treated 600 trees. Um, it was five people, where did I have that? Yeah, five people treated almost 600 trees in five hours. That was huge. That makes it economically feasible to affect control on that, on that, of that size level, on that amount of area. And they figured the cost of the product was about a dollar per diameter inch, which is cheap. So, you know, that is a, definitely a viable technique. So, now, you know, it's like my plan for, uh, to, to, for the state. Um, I'm starting basically, I've, I've just been, been pitching this concept because we have a number of disparate uh, uh, or organizations and agencies across the state that are deal trying to deal with this and we need to get organized. And so um, I'm trying to get everybody together under an umbrella and um, I just got sort of promised financing by the Forest Service to hire a real live person to actually coordinate this, which is just fantastic, but I'm still searching for matching funds. Uh, it's a one-to-one -one match. But basically, the idea is to identify, engage private, federal, state st stakeholders, get them together at the table, get a scientific advisory board together to help guide their efforts, 
to identify priority hemlock stands. You know, everybody has different criteria, but we need to know what are the best, what are the most valuable stands we have, and then we can ga engage volunteers or whatever to be sure that they get monitored, that people look at them all the time, um, develop mapping so that the mapping is accurate so we can follow it, uh, develop and implement best management practices, you know, look at what works, see what doesn't work, and modify our plans as time goes on. Engage stakeholders to assess management e efficacy. That's something right now that's difficult. I mean, we all don't, we, we all have, are doing way too much for, uh, uh, with so li too little funds to really do that effectively. But this is important. Management efficacy is like, you, you can't keep doing the same wrong thing. Establish hemlock gene conservation strategies and then work on the biocontrol. I think the, the biocontrol, we're 10 years behind right now, and we really need to ramp that up across the state. So that's my idea for world domination with hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, now, emerald ash borer is huge here, and I think it's like, phew, I don't know, what, what can I say? You all drove down the road here, right? You see all the ash trees along the road? They're all dead. They're, they're cooked. And, and you just look out the window here, and you can see there's ash trees there. They have woodpecks all over them. They're le I mean, I had a hard time when I was parking my car because I was looking at all those ash trees and saying, oh, well, there's no windstorm. They're all over. And the, in eco the economic impacts are absolutely huge around here. The trees, there are ash trees all around here, and they're leaning towards the building. Great. So how, how expensive is that going to be to take out? Um, you can't get anybody to climb them because they're already dead. The tree companies, they won't climb trees that are already dead because they've lost most of their tensile strength and it's too dangerous to do that. So you have to have a big tree, you have to have a crane. Uh, there's, and just down the road here I noticed there was a huge ash like this leaning over the road, leaning over the power, power lines. Nobody's going to climb that tree. That is going to be, and you couldn't fall. I'm a good faller, and I could not follow that tree where it needs to go, uh, be probably because you know I don't know if I'd have the holding wood to make sure it went, went where it's supposed to go. I mean, it's just huge the impact of this insect. Um, so, you know, what can we do? That's the question. And um, uh, right now, around here, boy, you're uh, one-year life cycle, very simple. You know, eggs, larvae, eats the bark of the inner bark of the tree, pupates in the wood. That's the problem. You can't peel the bark off because it's still in the wood. It pupates in the spring, emerges with the D-shaped exit holes, which are tiny, hard to see. The beetle comes out, feeds on leaves to mature her ovaries. Boom, one year life cycle, boom, 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 boom. Very, sim very simple compared to the hemlock woolly adelgid. It eats the phloem tissue, pupates in the outer bark or in the wood. That's the problem. This is a native insect. This is a longhorn beetle called the red-headed ash borer. This is the emerald ash borer with the nested bells on the back of the abdomen the back of the larval. Um, so what are the signs and symptoms? Basically, EAB will not attack just one tree. Around here, uh, pff, you don't need to worry about it. I mean, they're everywhere right here. There is, this, this population is absolutely huge. Um, all the trees have the same symptoms. Um, and uh, right, one, one of the problems I deal with in a lot of the state is that white ash when it grows, uh, um, white ash does not like to have wet roots. And so, as a farmer, which field would you be the, f would be the first to you'd let go? The wet one, right? And so they seed into wet fields, a lot of the wet fields, and they grow to a certain size to the point that they succumb to some kind of biotic or abiotic factor, and they start to decline. That's called ash decline. One of the causative organisms is called ash yellows. Um, but that's only a certain portion, a small portion of the total amount of decline. Um, and so a lot of people around the state, they say, oh, look at the ash, they're all dying, that must be emerald ash borer, it's, the game's up, forget it. And that couldn't be further from the truth. The ash borer is just starting in the state. Um, when you look for it, pest pressure is the most important thing. Early infestation, very few bugs around, bark splitting, woodpecker foraging, mid-level infestation, you get woodpecker foraging, epicormic sprouting, canopy thinning begins to show up. But by that time, you got tons of bugs. And right now, around here, you're in the heavy infestation area. Canopy thinning shows up very rapidly. I think trees are dying within one year. Um, and woodpecker foraging is rampant. Uh, in fact, it's, it's huge. 
I wonder how the woodpecker populations are going to respond. Um, but anyway, it's been interesting. Actually, I did work on bark beetles out west, and they looked at woodpecker response, and they found that there was no response to a superabundant food source. And, but make, that makes sense, because you've got a species that it feeds on superabundant food. It comes superabundant, then it crashes, superabundant, then it crashes. I mean, it's like you can't respond to that, otherwise you're going to just have a population going wildly out of control. So if, you're, you're, you, if you don't respond to that in your woodpecker, you don't respond in a population manner, your populations are going to be stable and you're going to be safe. So anyway, makes sense. This is bark cracking here. This is actually, this is where, okay, in early, on early level populations, they'll get one attack here, you'll get one attack there. It'll kill the bark about the size of your hand, right? And so that tree, that's dead. Otherwise, that, the, the bark of the tree is totally alive. And so it'll put on more growth and more growth and more growth. And so the bark will gradually crack. Here, this is a look at it right here. Here's the original attack. Right here you can see, right here, but it has five years of xylem growth over that wound. And yet here the bark, the uh, phloem tissue, is still perfectly happily green. I've looked at trees that have been attacked for seven years and they still had perfectly green leaves. They looked like they were just perfectly healthy trees. Seven years they've been attacked. Around here that doesn't happen anymore. No way. Um, even on the outer edges. You're looking maybe two or three years. Uh, this woodpecks are the way to go. It's the best detection technique we have. Um, here you can see if it's, it oxidizes really rapidly, but the fresh attacks have brown bark, and you can see where they reach in and they grab the larvae. This is actually near Ruby. Um, this tree, I'm, I'm convinced this tree was killed in one year. It's one of the few I've seen that have just been so intensely pecked on. I, was in, I saw the tree earlier and it didn't have any, it didn't see anything on it, and then came back later and it was like that. The bark is about a foot thick at the base of the tree. Very intense. This is much more normal, where you get just a average pecs all around here like that. And this is, it also gets it in perhaps the warm areas of the tree. And interestingly, I've appealed a lot of trees and uh, where the woodpecks are, the bugs are, and where they aren't, there's no bugs. And so why aren't there bugs up here? Or, you know, why aren't the bugs in this area here? Um, I don't know. It's just got to have something to think about, I guess. Um, this is here, this is in Sagardis. When we first got the two bugs in the trap, we went out and looked. I was in June, late June, July, early July, and I remember looking at this tree and seeing nothing at all. I went back in uh, late September, early October, see by the leaves, and the woodpeckers had totally stripped that side of the tree. That was the warm side of the tree. The cool side of the tree facing east was, didn't have any bugs in it, interestingly enough. Um, and here you can see this is in Monroe County near Rochester where they just, they peel certain areas of the tree. Very easy to see. I mean, even at 60 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour on the throughway, you can see them. This is the native red-headed ash borer, which is a native insect going after weakened tissue. It's, it's a cerambicid, it goes deeper into the woods, so the woodpecks are deeper into the tree. Whereas this is EAB, it's just sort of like all around shallow woodpecks. This is epicormic sprouting. When there aren't too many woodpeckers around, this is a good, because you can see the, the tissue distal to that is all dead. This is a response to fill in branches to the dead places. White ash has wimpy epicormic sprouts, but you don't really need it because here you have woodpecks in the tree. And this is canopy thinning. Canopy thinning basically is not a reduction in the number of leaflets, but a reduction in the leaflet size because the leaflets, when they're expanding, they don't have as many resources to grow to their full size because the beetle has cut, the, has cut those resources off. And I like this one because one of the most common, one of, one of the common responses is, well, it still has green leaves. I can't believe you want to cut it down to kill the bugs. And then you look at it and there are no more. There is no more green tissue down below. The phloem is already consumed. It's just living off that last little bit uh, that keeps the greens, the, uh, the leaves alive. Um, so once again, I think it, you got to think about this thing. You know, where are we strategic, strategically 
in the overall infestation. So this is 2003. This is when they, in 2002, they first discovered that this was causing the mortality. Then they looked around. <laughs> so, um, and, they look, and so this is where it is now. And the thing is, it's not everywhere. I mean, it's not like this whole area is infested. New York State, pff, less than 10% you know, of the forests. And the same is everywhere. So this is not the time to put our head in the sand. The most important thing, I think, for everybody is to understand that this is the logarithmic uh, uh, population growth curve. Um, it's like, OK, from when you, when you get very little mortality till you got almost total mortality, it's just like a very few years. It just happens so rapidly. And you've got to be prepared for it. Um, this is here you have 28% ash in this, these counties here. We're down to around 4 or 5% around here. Uh, it's a really totally different story up there. Some of the populations are growing very rapidly. This is Rochester. This is 2010. This is 2014, so it had gone 5, 10 miles uh, in four years, so two and a half miles a year. Here's Buffalo, 2012, 2014. Again, probably two and a half, maybe a little bit more per year where it had been detected. Um, this is the current Buffalo thing. So it's spreading rapidly. These are spots, though. I mean, it's like in between, there's no mortality. You can hardly detect it. But in these areas, these spots, that's where the mortality is. Um, and then you've got this area where we first detected it near Socrates, and those two beetles in a trap. Then we looked around, and it was rather embarrassing because there were 60 square miles of infested trees. Um, I want you to look at the Ashokan Reservoir here. This is five miles. This is 10 miles. OK, so this is 2010, right? So this is 2014, and here you have 5 miles, 10 miles, 15 miles, and actually these I found uh, recently, so that's 20 miles in four years. It's 5 miles a year, the expansion rate. And, but they're not all dead in these areas. It's like there's spot infestations. There's a lot of live trees in between. The total, the, most of the mortality is centered around this area here. Um, you know, it's, so it's expanding rapidly. Uh, if you're going to treat trees, if you still have a good canopy in your tree right now, treat it. Because uh, once you see that canopy decline, there's no options. Uh, homeowners are going to be uh, experiencing the greatest impact, homeowners and municipal governments, because of the public health hazard, the number one thing. It's like when these trees die, you have one year to take them down. Otherwise, they fall down. And they don't fall down in dainty little pieces like elms do. They fall down in huge chunks. That is the problem. Every municipality that I know, that, I know, that I'm familiar with their municipal forester in the Midwest is involved in some kind of lawsuit because they missed a tree. And just think about it. As a homeowner, it's like you're responsible for that tree. Your insurance company is going to say, oh, you're generally infested with emerald ash borer. You should realize you have dead trees if you have an ash tree. You're responsible for them. The insurance company is not taking it on this one. It's the homeowners that are taking it. Ask your insurance company. So take it down. Just like this. Yeah. Oh, either treat it or take it down. You've got to plan for it. Uh, and as a municipality, you're in the same position. As, as, as a homeowner or as a landowner within a municipality, you have, you're responsible for trees. You better know where those trees are, and you better have plans for them. Otherwise, you're going to be caught. It's like, have you looked at all the schools? Have you looked at all the parks? Have you considered how you're going to maintain all the rural roads, like this road here? This is huge. I mean, it's going to take thousands of dollars just on this mile of road. It's crazy. Uh, uh, and you know, you've got to think about it. You think you have within one year? <coughs> with one year? Within one year, they lose 50% of their tensile strength. It's huge. Absolutely huge. And that's, that's what they operate on in the, in the Midwest right now, one year from their death. And they try and get them beforehand. Davy tree won't even climb a tree if it shows symptoms greater than 30% canopy decline. And if they can't climb a tree, that means they have to take in a crane. And you know how much that costs. It's absolutely huge. Uh, are you beginning to get it? If you think about the power infrastructure, I mean, it's, it's, I, I can't even begin to 
I mean, you just go down the road here, you can see the power lines there. You can see all the ash trees over the power lines. I think New York is perhaps in this crosshairs of the emerald ash borer more than any other state because we have so much rural infrastructure exposed to ash trees. Basically, just the numbers here, thinking about power transmission lines. I uh, did this with my friend from National Grid, uh, and, uh, Brian Skinner. 106,000 miles of transmission lines. Conservative estimate of 200, 242 trees per mile, 26 million trees. Conservative estimate of 20% ash, I think it's probably more. Mix of 5 million ash trees. And a conservative estimate of tree removal of $300 a tree makes it $1.5 billion that the ratepayers are going to be responsible for. And that's with proactive management. And you know what happens. It's like right now, none of the power companies that I know of are being proactive. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. That's really good to hear because I have everyone else I've talked to, NYSEG, National Grid. National Grid was trying to be proactive. Their, their foresters are trying to get the top people, the office, to do something, to make a plan, and they're resistant to making a plan. So I, I bring this up and I raise it, raise the question, because it's us that are going to be paying. So my job is basically to restore all the ash species and mitigate the economic impacts. And I think we can do this, but I don't have enough time. Uh, basically, I think what we need to do to restore all the ash species, my three-point plan, is to establish biocontrols. We have the parasitoids out there. They're being grown. They're being released. We need to get them spread across the landscape because I can guarantee you every tree that's not treated is going to die. And we can't treat all the trees. But I think we need to treat trees to keep the genome alive across the landscape. Absolutely essential to do that. You can treat your pet trees, keep those big, beautiful things alive. Very, very important. And then we can work on identifying and incorporating resistance into the genome. That's the three-point plan. In 50 years, I hope to have ash back on the landscape. But we won't if we don't do these things. We need the biocontrols from China that are in place. We need to work on resistance. And we need to conserve the ash genome. So you already have Biological controls are being released, and they're established here. And why haven't they taken effect on the tree? Think about it. The timing? The There's too many of those beetles out there, absolutely. The numbers just aren't there. They can't reproduce fast enough. There's no way they are going to be able to affect control. And they but a drug like the, for the others, for the hemlock, that could save the trees. The insecticides work. The insecticides are... are This is the insecticide that works, imamectin benzoate, triage. That'll keep them alive for three years. You just have to keep treating them every three years. It's effective. Uh, it costs probably about $5 a diameter inch right now. Keep the trees alive. And a lot of communities in the Midwest right now are trying to keep all their trees alive because they realize it's a lot more cost effective to keep them alive than to cut them down. And besides, it makes people happy to have trees. You ought to try cutting down all the trees in somebody's street and seeing how they react. Um, so anyway, I got to stop. I'm the footnote to the most important part. Uh, it's it's really important that you uh, listen to that uh, information because. Knowledge is the important part of it. Um, I work on the Woodstock Environmental Commission. Back uh, 2010, we, the Environmental Commission realized we had to do something. I had been working with uh, Mark Callan from DEC. We had identified the insect in Woodstock. We knew it was, it was moving. The very first thing we decided to do was education. We began to do workshops. We partnered with the uh, um, Land Conservancy for the workshops. We partnered with CRISP, the Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership, to do some things in terms of getting the information out, out there. It was still very, very slow. People said, oh yeah, ashes are dying. They've been dying for years because of the ash dieback. 
people who recognized ash trees said, well, they die. And we said, no, this is something different. You know, uh, oh yeah, well, not much interest. Uh, so we also were trying to educate the town. Starting in 2010, it was 2013 before we got the town to adopt a, adopt a preparedness plan after an educational blitz on them and continued pressure on them. Uh, it was very brief and to the point. Um, my old eyes don't read print anymore. Uh, basically it was uh, remove the heavily afflicted and dying ash trees. Second, treatment with insecticide of carefully selected ash trees whose continued existence is deemed of high public interest. So again, along with what Mark said, treat some of these really nice trees. Um, and then preemptive removal of ash trees located in highly trafficked uh, public places um, that were a public threat. Uh, so. They finally passed that resolution, uh, and we got them to pay attention to a couple ash trees that really needed to get removed. New York State was at that point helping remove some along state highways. Uh, the next thing we did was we got them to begin to spend money to treat some really important trees on the town property, uh, the Cuomo property, which is a big area where the town offices are and walking trails and soccer fields. We started out with a 36 inch diameter ash, beautiful one that sits right on the lawn outside the town offices and said, you really should save that tree. Well, that was an expensive one because you pay per diameter inch for the injections. Uh, triage was what was used. Um, the next year, we talked them into doing six more trees. And then after that, we had found a seed tree, a small seed tree, produced really good trees. It was near the big one, so it was from that tree. It was, you know, so the genetic thing was there for, for that eventually to be a big tree. And I had gotten a town councilman to go with me to it seed collection workshop, uh, and we got enough seeds from that tree for the collection, half of them stored in the cryogenic seed bank out west, a quarter of them used for research in Long Island, and a quarter of them saved with Town of Woodstock's name on them. So, 20 years from now, Emerald Ash Borer has killed all the trees, we want new ash trees, to start coming up because we've got biocontrols in place. So we start throwing out the seeds. We've got it there. So we've done those things. Uh, we've also tried to encourage people to do creative things in terms of how do you manage this? Uh, you know, think, think out of the box in terms of, in terms of management. Uh, one of the ones outside in New York State that I just saw was very interesting. In Pennsylvania, there's a area with a big forest that they realized they were going to be threatened by the emerald ash borer and the woolly adalgid. And the woolly adalgid goes after the hemlocks, which are really, you know, like Mark said, they're a foundation tree. They're incredibly important. They didn't know how they were going to get the money to treat all these trees. Well, they said, look, it's going to be easier to reestablish the ash trees. And if you have the ash trees all out of there, the bug won't come into this area because there'll be nothing to eat. So they harvested all the trees uh, for lumber, firewood, things like that, that they could get money for, and the money was used to treat the uh, hemlock trees to save them. So thinking about those kind of things. Uh, we have in Woodstock also encouraged things like, how do you use the wood? How can you, how can you uh, do things with this that'll, that'll earn money from it? Uh, we've gotten some 
firewood producers approved as acceptors of ash logs because then they then will take off the bark, chip it up so it's no longer a danger, and then split what's remaining and sell it as firewood. So it becomes an economic advantage. You know, things like that to try to use different and creative solutions to uh, get the money that's needed. Uh, it's probably the biggest problem. I'm not sure Ag and Markets has always been on our side because they, they have made some of the things much more restrictive. And now their rule is if you cut down an ash tree, you have to leave it where you cut it. You can't move it at all unless you're permitted. People don't want to go through the permitting process. Uh, so it becomes problematic. Highway departments used to uh, cut them down and their highway workers would bring them home and burn them in their wood stoves. They're now saying, no, you can't do that. You gotta take them to an approved site or this or that or the other. So it sort of, it sort of makes it more difficulty. Um, highway departments are also under a great deal of stress. In Woodstock, uh, they had a plan. They were gonna start the removal along the roads. I helped them identify areas they really had to go to work on because uh, as Mark said, in one year from the time they're dead, it's 50% loss of their strength. Two years, it's two thirds of the strength is gone. So if you have a dead ash tree standing up there and it's up above the ground, it splits into two branches this big around, the wind's gonna break it right at that branching spot. And think about what an ash tree, what an ash log this big around, six, seven feet long is gonna do to your car if it falls on it. Uh, you know, it's a real liability. Uh, the plan was in place. The state condemned two or three bridges in town. And so they had to start, the highway department then was immediately diverted to bridge replacement. And we now in Woodstock have many trees that are hanging over the roads that are, that are a liability. Uh, if it's just starting in your community, it's important for your leaders to know the quicker you do it, the better off you are. Removing, if you've got 50 trees, 10 trees a year for five years is a lot cheaper than removing 50 trees in a year. You know, so you start as soon as possible. Um, so basically my takeaway points are, is learn about these things, educate your friends and neighbors. You know, education is the very first part and be creative. What can we do? Are there new ways we can deal with this? Because it's, uh, it's changing times and it's an issue that really is going to affect the public. Can you clarify again what, what we are to do once we take the tree down? We can't cut it up, we can't give it to neighbors who have wood stoves. We can't do anything with it, we have to just leave it right there? That's what the- the boat to stay alive in that? That's what Ag and Markets is telling you at this point. What I'm going to tell you is that during the winter season, these bugs hatch uh, somewhere starting mid-May, somewhere around mid-May, uh, into June, maybe early July. That's what's called the fly season. Until then, it's under the bark here, you know. Then it drills its way out. There's a little tiny hole that you, there are some of them in here that you can barely see. And that's when it's moving around. That's when they absolutely don't want it moved. It is totally safe to move these during the winter months. They, they, some, they say, oh, you shouldn't move them at all because they'll go, go in a wood pile and then they will be someplace else when they come out of that thing. Well, if you know they're gonna be burned because somebody needs the firewood, it's safer to move them during that firewood season and get them into that fire because that destroys the insect. Do they still go at it while the tree is dead? Are they still doing their whole life cycle? If that little, little larvae thing is in there when you cut down that tree in the wintertime, it will come out of the wood pile in the spring. Yeah. So my dead tree has a, a colony in there. Those trees, 
that are being woodpeckered are being woodpeckered because those, those bugs are in there and there are thousands of them in there. And the, the, the woodpeckers won't get them all. At, uh, they estimate at the very top predation rates, the woodpeckers would not even be able to get 80% of them. So there's still 20% in there to hatch. Um, and those things will come out. New ones won't go into that tree because it's dead. There's no live phloem in there for them to eat, so they'll go someplace else to lay their egg. But they are alive. They are alive in that tree. Yeah. They didn't want to move it because they had to take it to other trees. That's yeah. What I'm yeah. But if you if you burn it, the other thing that kills the insect is chipping into small chips. Oh, it does kill it. Yeah. So if you have branches from the tree, you can chip it, and it's totally safe. Well, burning in the fire, like my burning. fire in my yard. It's very safe to burn it. Mm -hmm. Don't leave it in the woodpile. And don't bring it to a state campground. And don't give it to neighbors who need wood. If you know they're going to, if it's cut during the winter and you know they're going to burn it, yeah, let them burn it. It's better than leaving it lay there. If you cut it during the summer, forget it. Yeah. On the grounds of the Empire State Railway Museum, DEC came in uh, two years ago and girdled about, I think it was around 80, 85 trees. Right. They cut them down the next year and bucked them and left them there. And they told us we could leave them two years before we moved them. Uh, I don't remember if that's two years from the time they girdled the tree and killed it, or two years from the time they bucked them up. But apparently, at some point, the larvae that are in there die without emerging. Is that correct? Uh, this was DEC. There were some. There were some initial indications that some of the larvae may take two years to come out, wasn't it? And so there was a possibility that some, the majority of them appear to come out after one year. After the death of the tree? No, I mean after the time the eggs are laid. Okay. The eggs are laid in one season, they come out the next season. But there were some indications some may. If there's live phloem there for them to eat, they will stay alive. <laughs> There's no way they're going to be alive beyond two years in that thing, you know. So we could move them without burning. Yeah. Do they go to any other tree beside the ash? Nope. No. Nope. There's one bush that they, or a smaller tree that they are sometimes in, but not a spreading factor. When the ash are gone, it's gone. So even so, the town of the town of Woodstock, they shouldn't be cutting them during May and May through July. They should, if they cut them, they have to leave them exactly where they are. Well, the dead ones they should be cutting mm -hmm. because they're dangerous. But they can't move them. But the best time to do the tree cutting is uh, during the from October to April. That's the busy season. You got to put all this in perspective of. Their budgets, their their the, just yeah. people. So Jim has uh, samples. This is, this is what the little bug looks like. The little green guy that flies around. Um, and these, these here are the little uh, larvae that, uh, do we call them larvae? Or? It's a like a little grub that is underneath the thing and, and eats away at it. There are a couple informational panel uh, things up here. Help yourself to those. Uh, feel free to do it. Uh, it looks so innocent in here. I mean, you can mark contact information up as well, so in case anybody has questions about things he didn't necessarily get to, you can, uh, you can reach him uh, by email. Um, thank you, Jim, for uh, your talk, and Mark as well. I want to thank both of you very much uh, for the information today. And thank you all for uh, coming to the presentation. And we have concluded 2015.